Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about one of the important acid-based disorder that is metabolic alkalosis. We can see here, metabolic alkalosis means primary elevation in the base that is mostly bicarbonate with or without compensatory elevation of carbon dioxide partial pressure that is PaCO2 is either compensated or not, not compensated. We will see what happens if bicarbonate is elevated in our body. Bicarbonate is mainly managed by the buffering system in between kidney and lung. Kidney plays a major role in adding or removing hydrogen ion to produce bicarbonate or remove bicarbonate from the blood. When there is metabolic alkalosis, bicarbonate levels increases. And when it become alkalo alkali, that blood become alkali, the pH will increase. We know that pH reduces when acidosis, pH increases when alkalosis. So bicarbonate increases, pH increases. Initially, PaCO2, nothing will happen. It will be normal. But after some time, to compensate this uh, alkalosis, body will try to increase PaCO2, thus it try to increase carbonic acid, thus it tries try to improve the uh, pH towards the acid side, but not uh, completely lower than the normal. In between 7.35 and 7.45, it will try to keep, that is called as compensation. So metabolic alkalosis initially bicarbonate increases, pH increases, PSCO2 also increases, all will increase. You can see the compensation part, all will increase. We can calculate the PSCO2 by 0.7 into bicarbonate plus 21 that will give the uh, carbon dioxide, expected carbon dioxide level. If carbon dioxide is more than that expected range, then we have to think additional uh, uh, type 2 respiratory failure. So the, uh, the carbon dioxide expected compensation has occurred. If it is more than that calculated value in ABG value, then you have to think an additional acid based disorder and an additional uh, uh, respiratory acidosis. If the expected carbon dioxide level correction is not like what you are seeing in the calculation, then there is some other problem which has produced al more alkalosis. Something else other than the basic uh, metabolic alkalosis, some other alkalosis like uh, respiratory alkalosis uh, is present or not, we have to find out. Now, there are a <coughs> lot of causes for uh, respiratory alkalosis, uh, sorry, metabolic alkalosis. We can uh, see what are the causes for metabolic alkalosis. One is hydrogen loss, hydrogen ion loss. It can be through GIT, prolonged vomiting. It can be through kidneys uh, that is produced by diuretics. If you are continuously giving lasics to a patient, patient develops uh, metabolic alkalosis. If the patient has severe diarrhea and vomiting, uh, patient develops uh, metabolic alkalosis. Addition of alkali, alkali is not very common uh, in routine clinical practice, but patients who are admitted in ICU and all, they may get uh, soda bicarb and some patients may go to alkalotic side. That's, that's why we have to think about this bicarbonate addition. Multiple dress, blood transfusion sometimes can produce metabolic alkalosis. Bicarbonate retention very important that is commonly seen in secondary uh, hypertension condition that is primary hyperaldosteronism or Korn syndrome, Cushing syndrome, corticosteroid therapy, severe hypokalemia, all these things will produce bicarbonate retention. So we can remember these causes with a mnemonic that is vomitus, vomiting, over administration of bicarbonate, mineralocorticoid access that is Korn syndrome, Korn syndrome intestinal loss, chlor chloride losing diarrhea. Treatment with diuretics like classics, excess cortisol that is Cushing syndrome or steroid therapy, renin secreting tumors, 
severe hypokalemia. So all these things are the common causes for metabolic alkalosis. But in ICU, one of the most important causes is iatrogenic, that is excessive in the, uh, intake of uh, soda bicarb through uh, IV route. Now metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia has got a very strong relationship that we will see afterward. Hypokalemia can lead to metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis can produce hypokalemia. So both these things are interrelated. So any patient who is having uh, hypokalemia, they develop alkalosis. Any patient is having severe alkalosis, they develop hypokalemia. Metabolic alkalosis can occur due to a shift of hydrogen ion into the cells. This occurs in patients with potassium deficit and hypokalemia. So we will see these things in the next slide. So during hypokalemia, to maintain serum potassium level, potassium moves out of the cells and hydrogen ion moves inside the cells will lead to alkalosis. So hypokalemia will shift the hydrogen ion into the cells and potassium will shift out that produces uh, alkalosis. Whereas in primary alkalosis, potassium is shifted inside the cell to the cell uh, to shift out hydrogen ion to extracellular space that can lead to hypokalemia. So both are interrelated. Hypokalemia can produce alkalosis, alkalosis can produce hypokalemia. So, so that is very important. Any case of hypo, uh, metabolic alkalosis, you, you see there will be some amount of hypokalemia can be there in that patient. Now again, hypo, uh, metabolic alkalosis is uh, reclassified into another two important uh, classifications, saline responsive uh, metabolic alkalosis, saline resistant metabolic alkalosis. Saline responsive means here the urine chloride is less than 15 milligrams per liter. Here in saline resistant, it is urine chloride more than 20 milligrams per liter. Saline responsive conditions are uh, vomiting, gastric suction or gastric uh, uh, GA tract disturbances, diuretic, multiple transfusions uh, and uh, uh, other conditions. Saline resistant means uh, hyperaldosteronism, Cushing syndrome, Barter syndrome, severe hypokalemia. So two important classification, one condition will respond to your normal saline infusion, another condition, uh, it will not respond to your normal saline infusion, there is some other problem, we have to correct the problem like hyperaldosteronism, we cannot treat the patient with normal saline, we have to treat in a different strategy, we have to control the blood sugars, potassium sparing, diuretic has to be given, then sorry, we have to control the uh, blood levels of aldosterone by doing surgery or something. So the treatment is different, treatment has to be given for the patient. So primary metabolic alkalosis, volume depleted or it may depend on the volume, you may respond to the uh, volume, volume expanded, it may not respond to volume. Vomiting, nasogastric suction, low chloride intake, diuretics, high urinary chloride, diuretics, Barter syndrome, gentleman syndrome. High plasma renin activity, renin artery stenosis, renin secreting tumors, low plasma renin activity and high aldosterone adenoma that is very common. Then other conditions also you can see. But they are not very common. Cushing's is common and Korn syndrome is common. Other conditions are not very common like Liddell syndrome, Gittleman syndrome and all not very common. Now what will be the clinical finding of uh, metabolic alkalosis. More severe alkalemia increases protein binding of the calcium leading to hypocalcemia and it may lead to symptoms of hypocalcemia like paresthesia especially in the uh, mouth and fingers, carpopedal spasm, neuromuscular irritability, uh, seizures. CVS it can produce hypotension, arrhythmias, uh, all these things. Concomitant hypokalemia can cause weakness, ECG changes, arrhythmias and all. Respiratory system, hypoventilation, hypoxemia, again hypokalemia can produce respiratory muscle weakness. Other, other findings like weakness and muscle cramps also can be there. 
Now, if you take arterial blood gas, you can see findings like this. Bicarbonate is elevated, pH is elevated, compensation, PaCO2 also elevated. You can calculate the compensation by uh, 1 milli equivalence of bicarbonate will be equivalent to 0.5 millimeter of mercury PaCO2, pH increases by 0 0.003. For example, a patient who is having uh, metabolic alkalosis, who come with high BP, potassium is low, urinary potassium is high, that is Korn syndrome. So, metabolic alkalosis, most of the time, hypokalemia is a part of that. And if the patient is having high BP, you have to always think about Korn syndrome or Cushing syndrome. Now, hypokalemia Serum potassium is very important uh, in metabolic alkalosis. Hypokalemia is always associated with uh, uh, metabolic alkalosis. But depending on the urinary potassium, when there is uh, hypokalemia, normally kidney should try to retain potassium. Urinary potassium will be low. That means potassium is lost through some other route. So, like a patient who is having severe vomiting and he has developed uh, metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia and if you examine the patient uh, urinary potassium will be low because potassium is lost through the vomitus whereas a patient who is having Korn syndrome or patient is on diuretic uh, if the patient develops metabolic alkalosis hypokalemia if you see the urinary potassium it will be more than 15 milliequivalents or some books have given more than 20 milliequivalents per day that means patient is losing potassium through the kidneys <coughs> One of the important condition in that is Korn syndrome, that is primary hyperaldosteronism. Here patient will have urinary loss of potassium because of hyperaldosteronism. Patient will have hypertension and on ABG you get uh, metabolic alkalosis with hypokalemia and patient is having hypertension. If you check the urinary potassium, it is very high. Patient is losing potassium through the kidney. So, that gives a condition, classical condition that is Korn syndrome. Here, plasma renin activity will be low. Whereas, the similar condition you can see in patients who is on LASIX, patient is having diuretics. So, similar presentation can be there, but plasma uh, aldosterone may be normal and patient will have history of uh, this uh, intake of diuretic. Urinary chloride. <coughs> Saline responsive and saline resistance we have seen previously. So, urinary chloride is an important investigation in metabolic alkalosis. Now, treatment is very, very important. If the patient is having saline responsiveness, we have to give normal saline. Normal saline infusion rate is typically 50 to 100 ml per hour uh, uh, should be started. So, that is only done if you have a uh, saline responsive uh, metabolic alkalosis otherwise it is not required if the patient is having hypokalemia potassium should be corrected oral potassium or IV potassium potassium sparing diuretic like uh, spironolactone should be given now a simplified approach will be saline responsive metabolic alkalosis re-expand the volume by normal saline potassium sparing uh, uh, diuretic can be given or potassium supplementation can be given H1 uh, uh, blockers, BPA can be given in vomiting and uh, nasogastric irritation. Uh, nasogastric tube uh, suction should be stopped immediately. Continuous suction if you are giving that should be stopped. Unless there is no major contraindication, it should be stopped. Stop diuretics and other things should be done. Hemodialysis is uh, done rarely in metabolic alkalosis. And uh, if it is saline unresponsive like Korn syndrome, surgical removal of mineral corticoid producing tumor that is very important. Spironolactone or epilron can be given. AC inhibitors uh, can be started. Steroids should be stopped. Potassium repletion should be given. So, we have discussed about one of the important problem in emergency room that is metabolic alkalosis. One of the most important problem in metabolic alkalosis is should remember that it is Cushing syndrome, Korn syndrome, patient is on diuretics, patient is having vomiting and severe diarrhea. That most common is patient is having severe vomiting produces hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. And most uh, important thing which we should never miss is a Korn syndrome.
first corn syndrome patient just present with high BP, low potassium, metabolic alkalosis and uh, potassium will be low, urinary potassium will be very high. Thank you. Thank you.